I'll be talking about real-time cell analysis and flow cytometry and how we're leveraging those technologies uh, to characterize some potential biomarkers of aggressiveness in colorectal cancer. And my institution requires me that certain things are disclosed, and those are up here on the slide for you to read if you're interested in them. Colorectal cancer is the fourth most deadly cancer overall in the United States. There are nearly 133,000 new cases of colorectal cancer reported each year. And as far as uh, number of mortalities associated with cancers, colorectal cancer is the second most deadly with 50,000 mortalities annually in the United States. Uh, the stage at which colorectal cancer is diagnosed has a profound impact upon uh, the prognosis for the, for the disease, and one out of five cancers are uh, diagnosed first at the distal metastatic stage, whereas the majority of them are uh, diagnosed at the localized or regional stages. And as I said, uh, the five-year survival differs greatly, with only 13% of patients with metastatic tumors surviving five years. Uh, whereas 70 to 90% of those with earlier stage tumors have, uh, do survive past five years. Another important uh, item to keep in mind is that of those individuals that are originally diagnosed with localized or regional colorectal cancer, over 50% will actually progress to metastatic disease. Colorectal cancer follows a similar metastatic uh, cascade as many other uh, solid tumors in that you have the primary tumor. Uh, that undergoes cellular changes uh, that are known as epithelial mesenchymal transition, or EMT, in which the epithelial cell-like tumor uh, cells within it uh, become more mesenchymal-like, uh, and they are able to invade through extracellular matrices and the epithelial cells of the colon wall, enter into circulation and also into the lymphatic system where they can colonize at different locations, such as the lung and liver if they're transported through blood vessels, or the lymph nodes uh, if they enter the lymphatic system. So with the majority of deaths being due to, uh, with metastasis being the primary cause of death in colorectal cancer and most people progressing to the, uh, to the metastatic stage, it's very important that we understand what is actually going on during EMT or um, in the processes where the tumor becomes capable of colonizing distal locations. So the questions that we asked in my lab are, what are the gene expression changes that drive colorectal cancer metastasis? Uh, and also, what are the roles for non-coding RNAs, such as microRNAs, link RNAs, uh, in metastatic progression? And also, can we use these as well as epigenetic signatures uh, as prognostic markers for disease outcome? And our approach is two-prong in that uh, much of my lab works using cellular models, and I'll talk a little bit about a cellular model of colorectal cancer progression that we've recently developed in my lab and how we've initially characterized this. Uh, and then secondly, uh, some additional work that I won't be talking about is utilizing specimens from the Mayo Clinic uh, Center for Cell Signaling and Gastroenterology, where we're looking at precancerous polyps, primary metastatic tumors, as well as paired normal colon tissues. Uh, so to begin to kind of explain to you how we generated the cellular model, I'll start off by uh, introducing the system or the, the apparatus that we've actually used, and it's this Boyden chamber system, which is basically a vessel inside of a vessel that's separated by a microporous membrane. So we have a larger chamber that is filled with serum-containing media. Serum contains cytokines. It acts as a chemoattractant for the cells. There's a second smaller chamber that sits inside of there that uh, contains the cells which are plated in serum-free media. And then there's a microporous membrane that separates the two chambers. And in this case, when we're looking at invasion, we've coated this microporous membrane uh, with a synthetic extracellular matrix. Uh, it commonly, commonly used product is Matrigel, but there are many other uh, similar products from other companies. And the very simple setup that we've used for our model, and it's, it's a very basic setup, but it turned out to be a very robust model, was to take SW480 cells, plate them in the top chamber, allow them to invade uh, for, a few, for a few hours, collect the cells that invaded through, expand those out, and repeat. Uh, SW480 cells are a pre-metastatic colorectal cancer cell line, uh, and they have very low invasiveness uh, and invasion properties. So these, uh, at each uh, repeat of this, or passage as we call them, the cells were subjected to mRNA-seq, microRNA-seq, and chip-seq as well. Um, 
So the invasion and migration capacity at each one of these passages was then assessed using uh, the, a modification of these Boyden chambers, which is uh, part of the Exelgen's real-time cell analysis platform. And that modification includes the inclusion or the uh, placement of these gold electrodes on the bottom of each one of these wells. And they're purchased from the company that way. So it's not like we had to actually build these ourselves. But here we have a, a, an EM image of them where uh, these larger, uh, lighter circles are the gold electrodes in the bottom. And these little dots are actually the pores that have been laser etched through the membrane. And here in this figure, you can see that there are cells actually, this is a, a lot larger magnification, and cells are migrating through those little pores. And when we talk about cell migration, uh, there's no ECM present, and cell uh, invasion is an ECM present. So that's the difference between those two terms as I go through some of the subsequent slides. So the excelligence actually measures it using impedance-based technology between these electrodes. So a small amount of current is passed through the system, and the uh, impedance or the conductivity at the electrodes is measured. So it's measuring uh, contacts, ionic contacts between the media and the electrode interface. And so if you plate cells on top and you have some that invade through, that's going to uh, impede the flow of, uh, flow of electricity. So in this case, these little arrows that you really can't see are supposed to represent uh, current flowing. And so in this red arrow here, uh, you have a few cells migrate. In the blue arrow, you have more cells. And that then manifests as a change in cell index, which are the uh, units of impedance that are output by the machine. So more invasive or more migratory cells will give you a stronger signal. Going back to our cell model, uh, we have our passages of cells with passage zero being the parental passage, passage six being the cells have gone through matrigel six times. And this is looking at migration, so no ECM present. Uh, we see no change in the, no significant change in the migration capacity of the cells for the first two passages. Uh, there's a large increase in passage three, and then they plateaued by passage four, where we see no, no more additional gain in migratory capacity. Uh, for those of you that uh, were in graduate school or postdocs before this technology, you're probably familiar with these crystal violet staining. Uh, membranes, which ruined all of our clothes when we were graduate students. Uh, so this is uh, the cells that have not migrated have been removed from the top of the membranes, and those that did are stained with crystal violet and then imaged, uh, and the results correspond to what we saw from the excelligence. Moving on to invasiveness, so again, uh, ECM-coded membranes. Uh, we see similar results, uh, no difference through passage two, and a more gradual increase in invasiveness as we increase in passage number. Uh, and again, uh, crystal violet stained membranes show similar results. So both of those techniques are cytokine dependent. Uh, we want to look at cytokine independent to make sure that we didn't just generate populations of cells that are more motile in general without responding to uh, cytokine cues. And for that, we did a scratch assay, very basic uh, scratch the plate with a pipette tip. We do it in an X so that we can track it more easily. And so we have our passage 0, 2, 4, and 6. Uh, we've cut down the passages for clarity in this image and monitoring the wound closure over time. And we see no real difference in cytokine independent uh, migration compared to what we saw with the cytokine dependent migration. Profiling these cells a little bit more, uh, we utilized the, uh, the NovaCyte uh, flow cytometer to look at cell proliferation uh, just using propidium iodized staining. And this is the raw, unfiltered data. I believe the, the postdoc actually took it as a screenshot just to show um, the way that it's directly shown on the, the screen of the computer when we, when we do the analysis. Uh, so uh, you've got your S and you've got your mitotic cells over here, and you can see that there's not a, a readily apparent change in cell proliferation, but there is a little bit of an increase in your in your G2M cells and your S phase cells. Uh, looking at the mitotic index using EDU staining, we do see a, a difference in the mitotic index, uh, suggesting that more of the cells are undergoing mitosis. Uh, as there, more of the invasive cells are undergoing mitosis than the non-invasive cells. One hypothesis that we had was that, uh, so because there's multiple rounds of selection in here are going on in this assay, that we've simply just selected out a stem cell sub, or a, a cancer stem cell subpopulation in our initial population. 
And to test this, we, we tested a variety of uh, so-called cancer stem cell markers, uh, which CD44 and CD24 are considered two of them, and compared uh, them across different passages. And we do see an accumulation of uh, CD44 cells, which is a, a weaker uh, marker of cancer stem cells, but, uh, and a little bit of an accumulation of CD24 cells, but it's definitely not the majority population. So we moved on to two additional markers, CD166 and CD133. And uh, here they're plotted compared to CD24. And again, we're not seeing a, a dramatic difference in CD133 or CD166 uh, positive cell populations. Uh, HCT116 is generally considered to be a cell line that has cancer stem cell-like properties and is a, a colorectal cancer stem cell line. Um, it's been reported as that. Um, whether or not there's such a thing as a cancer stem cell, that's a completely different discussion that I won't go into, but uh, definitely we're not seeing changes that are consistent with uh, what we observe in HCT116 cells. So we began to ask the question, what's actually happening in these cells? What are the gene expression changes that are occurring? And this data represents those gene expression changes at a global level in that uh, we've taken all genes across the genome and plotted them comparing the different passages. So here you have, for instance, passage two on the x-axis and passage zero on the y-axis. Uh, and what you would expect is that if there were gross differences in gene expression, the, the bigger the differences, the uh, buzzier this line would be, which indeed you do see bigger changes between P6 and P0 than, for instance, you see between P2 and P0. And when we uh, use uh, cufflinks to put an actual number on these differences, uh, this isn't a p-value, this is an indication of ver or, uh, variability in, uh, basically variability along this line. Uh, you see that the greatest differences were between P2 and P4, which is about when uh, the greatest differences in phenotype were happening as well. So the genotype changes corresponded with the phenotype changes. Uh, and the differences between uh, P0 and P2 were kind of not as, not as great and the same as between P4 and P6. So when we stratified this by genes that were increased significantly and decreased significantly, we had a number of uh, known and putative uh, genes that are involved in metastasis pop out at us, including uh, the proto-oncogene SARC, which include, encodes CSERC, uh, TGF-beta, and we also have uh, decreased in uh, PPAR gamma, HER2, and various others. And I'll focus just on, this is just data kind of validating our system. There are a number of other very interesting pathways that came out of this that um, I can talk to you individually about. But um, basically, SARC activates beta catenin and leads to cell invasion is a, a fairly well-known model. So we wanted to see if that's one of the pathways that was contributing to tumor progression in our model. Um, but I guess first I'll go into uh, one other piece of data. Sorry, I made a few changes that uh, this is a little different order than what I usually present. But uh, here, one of the other questions, and we talked about it, I talked about it with the uh, cancer stem cell question, but it also applies here is that, you know, did we just, instead of selecting out a cancer stem cell subpopulation, did we just select out some other population that may be a type of cancer stem cell but just doesn't carry those markers or might just be an invasive subpopulation? So we utilized, uh, we wanted to test if, you know, we, we thought if we looked at RNA expression at the individual cell level, we would be able to differentiate whether or not it was population heterogeneity or if it was actually a change in the overall expression per cell. And to do this, we utilized a, a prime flow RNA assay, which gives us single cell resolution data using flow cytometry. Uh, very briefly, uh, it utilizes gene-specific uh, oligos that then undergo this uh, signal amplification using pre-amplifiers uh, and uh, probes uh, to amplify the signal where we can actually differentiate with flow cytometry the cell, gene expression per cell. Uh, and one of the, so this is a controlled gene, RPL13, it's a ribosomal gene, uh, and this is RNA-seq data from the different passages, so 0, 2, 4, and 6 again, non-invasive cells, invasive cells at the bottom. No difference in RNA RNA-seq read counts going between passages, and no real significant difference in single cell expression uh, by flow cytometry. For some of the genes that were differentially expressed, RB1 and ATM, uh, again, P0 is the red line, P6 is the blue line, so RB1 
by RNA-seq showed a decrease in read counts, same thing with ATM. And consistent with that, we did see a decrease in single cell expression. CSERC was uh, increased in expression in subsequent passages, and the single cell data supported that as well. I'm only showing P0 and P6. I'm not including the two and four data on here, but it does show a gradual change. There's no, in the case of ATM, what we would expect is that if this population was being selected for, we would see a split in the population, and we're not, definitely not seeing that. Uh, beta catenin is one of the, um, I'm going to do what you never should do in a talk, and that's back up. So, uh, beta catenin is one of the downstream targets of SARC and promotes invasiveness. So, we wanted to determine if we inhibited beta catenin, would we be able to modulate the cell invasive phenotype? So, we use chemical inhibitors of beta catenin, IWR1 and PNU74654. And in our invasive cells, treatment with either one of these inhibitors decreased the invasive capacity. So here we have time after plating, and we have our cell index, so how invasive are the cells. DMSO is the blue line. These definitely have a significant uh, effect upon invasiveness. C59 is a Wnt pathway inhibitor, which is also involved in CSARP signaling, and inhibiting a Wnt pathway did not have any effect on invasiveness. And P0 cells as a control were not invasive to begin with. Uh, interesting as well that neither of these compounds inhibited invasiveness to this, to, uh, completely to the uh, degree that P0 cells were at. Uh, switching gears just a little bit, uh, one of the hallmarks of metastatic tumors is not only uh, proliferating profusely and, and uh, migrating to secondary sites, but also uh, becoming resistant to chemotherapy. And uh, my mentor as a postdoc worked quite heavily on a chemotherapy drug called 5 fluorouracil which is treated in a number of uh, solid tumors, one of the most widely prescribed chemotherapy drugs. And even in the advent of uh, targeted therapy, it's still very widely prescribed. And so we wanted to see if these metastatic cells were more or less resistant to, to chemotherapy drugs. And we utilized a different application of the exceligence. And in this case, instead of the electrodes being plated on the bottom of a trans well, they're in the bottom of a standard well. And so if you have cells, you plate them on the machine, the cells settle down and they attach, they interfere with the conductivity. If they're static and there's no change, there's no change in your cell index. Cells begin to die, you see a decrease in your cell index. If your cells are proliferating and dividing, you will see an increase in cell index, just to kind of set up these results. And uh, here we have cells that were either deficient in DP, we have DPD deficient cells, which DPD is a detoxifying enzyme uh, for 5 fluorouracil naturally occurring. So we have a cell line that does not express DPYD, and which makes them very, fairly sensitive to the drug. And we've either recapitulated that by transfecting and overexpressing wild type DPD or a catalytically inactive form of the gene. <laughs> And then we've treated them with serial dilutions of 5 fluorouracil to generate an IC50 or an inhibitory concentration type graph uh, like pharmacologists like to generate. And if a focus right here on this blue line, which is 10 micromolar, in the cells that express functional DPD, uh, 10 micromolar of 5-FU kills about half of the half of the cells is what we can take off of this. When we look at the cells that express a non-functional version, 10 micromolar, this blue line kills the cells similarly to the higher concentrations, and 3.3 micromolar is about our IC50 concentration. And when we plot that out, we do, I mean, it, it's pretty evident that there is a significant difference in IC50 concentrations. So we did the same type of experiment, but using our P0 through P6 cells, so using our cell model. And here we have P0 on the left as green, P2 is red, P4 is blue, and P6 is black. So we're also seeing in our cellular model that as the cells gain these invasive phenotypes, they're also gaining resistance to the drugs that we use to treat the tumors. Uh, so not only is it more, a more aggressive tumor, it's uh, more resistant to killing by chemotherapy agents. So the preliminary conclusions that we've drawn from this very early data is that we were capable or that we were able to generate this uh, highly invasive SW480 cell line using serial selection that displayed EMT-like markers, and that numerous pathways, including some that are disrupted in many uh, colorectal tumors, such as CSARC and beta-catenin, uh, contributed to this invasive phenotype. 
We also observed gene expression changes that were not likely due to popular. We also observed that these gene expression changes were not likely due to population stratification or heterozygosity or uh, heterogeneity in our selected populations. And finally, these uh, invasive cells that we generated were more resistant to 5 effuse. So in all, this model recapitulates a lot of what we see in both mouse models of colorectal cancer as well as human colorectal tumors. And these are the people that actually uh, did most of the work. Uh, Dr. Diazio is a postdoc mentor and uh, still serves as a mentor for me at Mayo Clinic. Rentian Wu is a postdoc in my lab who did most of the studies that you saw here today. And just highlighting over here on the right, uh, Lisa Boardman in the Mayo Clinic, Mayo Clinic Center for Cell Signaling in Gastroenterology is providing the clinical specimens that are complementing these studies. And Tomas Ordog in the Mayo Clinic Center for Individualized Medicine has developed some of the methodologies that we're using for those clinical specimens. And I'm funded through uh, grants from the Mayo Clinic Center for Individualized Medicine, uh, through the DPD Deficiency Foundation, and also a grant from CV6 Therapeutics. Thank you.